Hello everyone. Thanks for joining Coast to Coast. My name is Lillian Corral and I'm joined by Lily Weinberg. Hi Lily. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? Doing well. What's what's happening in, in LA in your world? In in my coast. Um, yes. <laughs> um, uh, everything is good in LA. I think we are um, we are now going into um, what looks like a, another sort of phase of this COVID yeah. pandemic. So um, we are both, I feel like starting to transition back to school as we talked about a little bit last week, and then also just sort of trying to um, uh, figure out a lot of like the work from home. I see a lot more chatter around um, the work from home timeline. I don't know if you yeah. saw it, but Google announced that they're not going back to an office until summer of next year. I didn't I, see that announcement. Yeah, so a lot of companies yeah. now are like, it's interesting, those companies are sort of setting a trend. And so, yeah, so now um, I feel like I hear a lot more chatter about companies um, and organizations, you know, just making really, really long-term plans for working. Yeah, home. yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's certainly been interesting to watch. And then, the, you know, like we, we talked about last week with the schools, I mean, that is on everyone's mind. Um, will it be virtual, um, which which in Miami, it's, it's actually being delayed. It's gonna be virtual longer. Um, and, and I think that really highlights the importance of our conversation today around the digital divide and, and who has access, who doesn't have access and, and, um, and all of that. But it's, it's, certainly a, um, it's certainly a dynamic time, that's for sure. Yeah, that's right, Lily. Work from home also has a lot of digital divide issues because I've heard a lot of companies have also kind of really struggled with like, do their employees really have the right setup? And then, you know, a lot of us have like commercial internet at home yeah. and that's not necessarily conducive to all these kinds of webinars and Zoom calls and meetings. So, um, that's so right. let's get yeah. into today's topic, which is the digital divide and digital yes. inclusion. And um, we're going to hear today about um, three cities. Um, we're blessed in the night at Knight Foundation that we're um, part of these wonderful communities that are doing really interesting things. And today um, we'll be learning from um, folks in San Jose, in Detroit, and in Charlotte about the digital divide and the way that they've been approaching it. Because these three cities are actually doing it in very in slightly different ways um, and have different levels of needs and. Um, and so it'll be a really interesting conversation. Um, I don't know if there are any things that, you know, strike you about the conversation. Yeah, about. a couple of things. So, so I am, I'm really interested in that, in that local piece. What does this look like at a local level? Like how, because, uh, you know, I would think many cities would struggle with the same things, but my understanding is that cities actually struggle with different things for the digital divide. And so a Detroit really looks different than a Charlotte, um, and uh, and so that that's going to be interesting to kind of to tease that out. I'm also really interested in the partnership piece and and what does that look like with our civic institutions like libraries, for example, which we've partnered with a lot historically. And um, so, anyways, I think it will be a good conversation. I'm excited to to hear what you guys have to say. Yeah. So for everyone who's joined us, please be um, mindful of um, putting your questions in the Q&A box. If you're joining us on Facebook, um, we'll also be monitoring that for questions. Um, but now let's get into it by having Bruce Clark, the Executive Director of Digital Charlotte, join us. Um, Josh Edmonds, the Director of Digital Inclusion for the City of Detroit, join us. And then Jordan Sun, the Chief Innovation Officer for the City of San Jose. Um, welcome. To coast to coast. Thanks so much, um, all three of you, for for joining us. Um, so let's get into uh, I think one of Lily's like first questions, which is what does this look like in each of your community, um, and in particular, um, you know, we this this issue has come up in a lot of our um, shows. Um, I was mentioning to you all earlier, it's come up in our open spaces um, shows. It's come up in last week's conversation with Walter Hood. Um, uh, it's come up in, you know, obviously in, in, in some of the conversations around digital engagement and civic engagement, what that looks like. Um, but when we say digital divide and digital inclusion, what does that actually mean? And do you all define it in the same way? Um, how, and how are your communities addressing it? So let's dig into Bruce. Maybe you want to kick us off? 
Sure. Yeah. Um, Lillian, thanks for having me. Um, appreciate the opportunity to be here with Jordan and Joshua. And Jordan, congratulations on your uh, promotion that came out yesterday. So City of San Jose is lucky to have you. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think we in Charlotte look to uh, for definitions, we look to the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, which lays out some of the definitions in a sort of a paragraph, uh, you know, four or five uh, sentences. But I think ultimately what when we kind of wade through that and, and talking to people, we're, we're really talking about how are people creating new opportunities in their life in a world that's driven by technology. Um, the three-legged stool often gets referenced uh, as a defining thing for internet access, technology, and digital literacy skills. Um, and we like to add on to that the ability for somebody to stand on that stool to reach up to the next level of uh, opportunity they're trying to create in their life. Um, and not that, not that the three legs are the end goal, but that they're a, a mechanism to help people achieve new and wonderful things in their life. So that's, I mean, a little bit of the way we look at it and talk about it here in Charlotte. Jordan or Josh, do you guys define it the same way in your city? Yeah, uh, you know, one thank thank you, Lillian, Bruce, Jordan, and and the Knight Foundation. Uh, so yeah, br following Bruce on this, I mean, he he definitely laid it out exactly how how, how most of us are doing it. I, and I think that um, the only thing I, I would just add on to that is like when we're focused on digital inclusion. We are definitely using that three-legged stool methodology. It's the easiest way to um, get enough stakeholders on board to say, ha, huh, I get it, <laughs> or I get it enough. I think our focus uh, has definitely uh, shifted beyond that um, to saying like, how do we operationalize everything? How do we build a legitimate operation where we don't have to always worry about how are we addressing the digital divide? How are we addressing those? Like, no, we are operationalizing it and we are making sure that as net new resources are uh, coming into our city, or we're attracting those that it's going into the model that actually ultimately boils down to those same three legged those those same legs of that stool but we're doing it in a way where we're actually accountable and we can actually expand and scale the model uh, again as resources come into our city yeah and i absolutely agree to both what bruce and and josh have mentioned you know i think part of that is reaching for those new opportunities standing on that stool right and so the digital divide is really just the first piece of <laughs> Of, of our mission here. Um, and then I would say for what Josh said in terms of making it scalable, I mean, absolutely. I think this is where it becomes unique, um, you know, where, where we have different populations with different issues about digital divide. And so, you know, what might resonate with the black community might not necessarily resonate with the Latinx community in terms of the concerns of why I want to be connected or why I don't want to be connected. Same thing with elderly and homeless. And so there's some nuances there where that value prop uh, needs to be addressed. And, and I think that's the operational nitty gritty that, that is very important in order for us to scale. Um, and, I, and I would say, you know, Mayor Sam Ricardo has been very early, uh, an early champion of this. I'm glad to see that so many cities are, are focused on the digital divide. So hats off to everybody. Great. So, um, you know, I keep hearing this phrase like COVID-19 has laid bare the um, inequities around the digital divide. What does that really mean? Um, and, um, and can you talk a little bit about your city's efforts around digital inclusion? So let's start getting into some concrete examples of how you're tackling the digital divide. But um, what, when we talk about COVID laying this issue now to bear and being much more visible to everyone, what does that mean for how you've been approaching the issue and, and how are you gonna approach it differently now that it's been so exposed. Okay, I'll start. <laughs> I'll, I'll say that, you know, for, for us, uh, I've been, um, you know, th th this type of work has really been enhanced by COVID because of the sheer amount of attention. Uh, that's been something where before we began looking at that through that three-legged stool model, the, the seat of that stool, that's where we focus on advocacy and, and awareness. And um, typically, uh, folks who cared about digital inclusion were folks who cared about digital inclusion. And that was kind of it. Uh, it didn't really extend beyond. Uh, and the, the relationships were truthfully in all of our communities, your libraries, um, you know, maybe a few churches, some nonprofits. Um, but that was in, in some, some, some great community groups. That was pretty much it. Now, all of a sudden, with COVID, oh, my gosh. I mean, <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's a fire hose, a, a partnership, an opportunity, which is great. And I think that for us and, um, you know, 
thankful to be on the call with, with uh, two other great cities where, you know, we were focused on this before COVID. And so, you know, making that very known that we're not doing a, a responsive effort that we're saying, Hey, this is all in response to COVID. It's like, no, this isn't response to it being the right thing to do. Um, but COVID has certainly made our efforts to say that we need to scale up as everything has pretty much shifted to being online that we're making sure. So I'll say in the city of Detroit, uh, you know, us laying out the infrastructure and getting everybody on board, uh, educating stakeholders uh, for, for quite some time. Now COVID hits. Well, you know, we were already in the position to, to act. And so one of the very first things that we were able to do was uh, fundraise a uh, very handsome $23 million uh, to connect every single uh, public school student with laptop, one year's uh, worth of tech support and, um, you know, internet access. And that's not to say that we've bridged the digital divide. No, we've at least put in the infrastructure to habitually be able to address it in whatever terminology or whatever term that comes up, whether it's, you know, us focusing on school kids, um, we've now demonstrated that we can do that. So now if we need to focus on uh, elderly or veterans or whomever, we've laid the infrastructure to act, which then goes back to the point of us operationalizing. Yeah, I mean, just in Charlotte, a little bit different than Jordan and Joshua is my, my particular position is not housed at the city itself. And so we, um, and I think just as like a disclaimer, not that it needs to be said, but, uh, you know, we're still learning and growing in Charlotte and, and can do better in a lot of fronts. So um, I mean, what we're sharing today is lessons learned, uh, also, you know, with some, some success, right, but still a lot of lessons learned. And um, so you know, we had been spending a lot of time on awareness. COVID obviously drove that awareness up. I think that there's reasons for a, a, a whole nother podcast on why that is and why certain segments of the population weren't paying attention to this issue. Um, but, you know, the key, and you mentioned in your intro, Lillian, was how this has been coming up in all these other spaces and all these other conversations is this issue is so intersectional with almost every other thing that we're trying to do as a city, as a country, as a as a you know humans right now and the way we look at the future and evolving and all these and whatnot and so um, the pain that many people felt when they had to work from home and deal with some of the issues that other people dealt with every day just added to the side of the scale of people who were more aware of this um, so you know in charlotte what that means for us especially with the way we're our charlotte digital inclusion alliance is structured is it's a host of different collaborators and organizations that come together um, it's convened right now by the by our library system, Seth Irvin, the chief innovation officer for Charlotte Mecklenburg Library, who's our convener. And really, it's about trust building and sharing best practices to help move these things, help move solutions forward more quickly and find new ways to serve our community. And, and what COVID has done has brought some new partners to the table. It's perhaps loosened up some of the uh, bureaucracy that might have slowed us down in the past. Um, but I still think we're on the front I still think we're on the cusp of what we can continue to do there and see. So um, Great. that's where we're at here. So Jordan, I'd love to hear about um, uh, what's happened in San Jose as a result of COVID, but I do want to go back to this point you made, Bruce. We, we cannot spend too much time on it, but I do want to go back to why different constituencies did not care about this issue before COVID, and now we do care about it. So let's definitely talk about that. Um, Jordan, what, what's been going on in San Jose? Yeah, I would say, you know, the first thing is and we already had, you know, when COVID hit um, the headlines, we already had the Digital Inclusion Fund uh, set in place. So we actually just launched there, you know, shortly there uh, before that. And so we had a $24 million fund with a minimum $1 million um, uh, worth of grants coming in through uh, private telco partners, public private partnerships um, to be able to um, address the three like a school problem. The other part is, you know, after COVID, you know, we recently uh, allocated you know, $8.2 million through the, the great work that the library has done for both community Wi-Fi, but also uh, mobile Wi-Fi hotspots in anticipation of children who need access uh, to internet. And so we're coupling that with, you know, other partnerships to make sure that the rest of the leg, um, uh, legs of that stool are being addressed you know, in terms of device and, and literacy need. Um, and then I would say the final piece of this is, is you know, we've also really gone, you know, COVID has stressed had some of our operation in terms of how do you reach those who are unconnected if everybody is in a virtual world, right? And so putting out messages and everything like this is a very different population because you're always alienating that segment, that 10%. 
And so you have to work with influencers in the community, but also rely on traditional channels. And we're very fortunate that, you know, folks like Univision have been offering like, hey, look, put out PSAs for us to, to bridge that digital divide. And, and so, um, you know, that's been really important and just kind of going back, thinking more outside the box of ways to reach communities that are otherwise under or unconnected. Great. Um, so, so why hasn't this issue been um, elevated prior to COVID? Why did it take a global pandemic for us to really um, acknowledge the importance of it? You're all, and, and, and Josh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm trying so hard um, not to laugh too much at this, but I mean, whoo, well, Bruce is probably going to give a really, really honest answer. Um, I'm going to give an honest answer too. Um, so uh, when, when, when we're looking at this issue um, and, you know, for, you know, er, earlier this year, I had a really, really just gratuitous opportunity to testify in front of Congress on digital equity. And um, that was a, a point to talk to Congress and say like, hey, like this is a, a priority. And I mean, it's aged really well because we did it before a pandemic, <laughs> letting people yeah. know, like, come on, man. I mean, heck, if someone would have brought that example up, I mean, geez. But like, you know, one of the things that is currently happening, uh, you have all these broadband acts, broadband bills, the House and the Senate, and, you know, we're not really getting uh, digital inclusion funding. Uh, we are getting funding for um, internet access, i.e. infrastructure in uh, mainly rural America and unconnected areas, but not really getting underconnected which really goes at what digital inclusion is. Digital inclusion is the nuance. That is us saying, why aren't people adopting technology? What can we do? What barriers can we reduce? That level of nuance, ooh, that it, it's difficult to conceptualize and to one, even fund that. I think that um, because we haven't really seen any type of funding come from the federal government to support digital inclusion in a big way, as a result, you don't have municipal governments that are empowered to do anything. And so like, it's, it's a really tough conversation because like, I'll be honest, like cities like Detroit were, and, and others across America, like who have a legitimate point person for digital inclusion that are actually empowered to do work. Um, that was a gamble. Um, that was us doing that without federal funding saying, we're going to figure this out because we trust in our local ecosystem enough to do it. But not every community is fortunate enough to be able to do that. We are very thankful for the Knight Foundation to be able to step in and say, hey, let's work with the city to, to, to accomplish this. We know it's an issue but not every community has at their disposal. So as a result, you have a lot of people who are just waiting for the federal government to then be able to supply that type of funding, then be able to do this work more within the city context. Without having a, a point person within the city, I think a lot of folks are just doing a lot of great work, but they're ultimately mitigating that degree of impact that you get with having a city government really trying to spearhead this work on the, on, on the ground. Yeah, and a big shout out to our, our former colleague, um, Katie Locker, who um, secured that funding. So Bruce, what's, what's your answer for, for why we haven't been caring about this? I mean, you know, I, um, it's an equity issue. And when you look at the data um, about who is generally, or who's mostly impacted by the digital divide, um, you know, communities of color, um, uh, elderly, uh, people who may have less um, ability to advocate or have this uh, the, been provided the opportunity to, to advocate uh, on their behalf. And so, um, which ties into systemic issues. And so I think that there's a whole system designed to keep the status quo, right? I mean, there's, without pressure from cities and organizations and nonprofit and philanthropy and corporate social responsibility and all the others to you know, change internet pricing or to, you know, get internet service companies to do that or to get companies to rethink their asset disposition so that we can gain access to all these devices or lifelong learning, right? We know that in something like 90 plus percent of, of professional development dollars in the, are spent before the age of 25. Uh, so what happens when you're out of school age and the rest of your life, where are you going to get this lifelong learning? So, um, to me, it's an equity issue, and we see right now with other uh, issues our country's facing that um, we have a lot of work to do to address equity-based issues, and so that's my kind of roundabout <laughs> answer. Thank you. Jordan, your situation is a little interesting in San Jose in that um, the genesis of the Digital Inclusion Fund is a partnership with some of the, the companies, the telecommunications companies. Can you talk a little bit about how 
that developed? Um, and maybe is that a model for other cities to think about? Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's in partnership with some of the major telcos here in the area. Um, and, you know, overall, I think it was, it was a very, you know, a, a wonderful sort of, uh, uh, quite frankly, innovative uh, uh, approach to public private partnership where, you know, in, in order for 5G deployment to, to occur, you know, Mayor Licardo, uh, as well as our city manager's office and, and my predecessor were able to negotiate a, an opportunity where, you know, we were uh, able to have a certain rate and therefore be able to fund um, our digital inclusion efforts. Because the part of it is, 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 you know, we don't want to hamper technology rollout and, and, and development and, and, you know, and, and, and fostering that innovation piece. But the other part of it is we can't forget that, you know, we also have to be inclusive and equitable. And so that's kind of where the genesis of it came out. I would say, you know, looking uh, a little bit further down the line, you know, I, I think there is an opportunity for us to really look at, uh, to rethink, you know, public private partnerships, uh, where I think there's sometimes a very antagonistic relationship still between companies and, and when you talk about inclusion and equity. And I, I know companies are trying to do more, uh, but I think, you know, there's, there's really a lot more room for us to be able to work together where it's, it's not only, you know, beneficial for, for economic development and, 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 you know, commerce, but at the same time, you know, we can really push the ball forward for some of the equity inclusion pieces so that we can take care of, even if it's just 10% of our population, well, that's still very significant. You know, we can't forget about that. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's really, you know, the key thing. And I just want to say, you know, to the early conversations, I hope that, this is not just the flavor of the month for digital inclusion <laughs> and that, you know, when we end crisis response, that we don't take the eye off the ball and people just say, okay, you know, mission, mission accomplished, we're done, you know, that we still focus on other aspects of digital inclusion because the, I don't think the fight's going to be over yet. Yeah. So thinking a little bit about the future then, um, I mean, one question I have, and, and I've done some of, I've done work around the digital divide um, for a while now, especially in California, and, um, or at least I did it a while ago. And one of the things that strikes me is that, um, so the three-legged stool, which is access to the internet, access to a device in the home, and access to the internet in the home, access to a device in the home, and then digital literacy training, right? Like how do you actually um, use the device and, and use the internet? That's been the model um, for a while now, right? For almost like 10 plus years in terms of how we go about trying to tackle this issue. And one of the things that we that I sort of think about now is like there's a continuum of connectivity. Like it is, the internet is so pervasive. Smartphones are so pervasive that, um, you know, I know that, you know, even sometimes I live in Los Angeles, like our homeless neighbors, they have smartphones and you see them wiring up or trying to trying to like get energy um, to their devices and, and using their devices. So it seems to me like there's a continuum of connectivity. And I guess the question I have for you all is, are we trying to solve this? Is this like a hammer versus a scalpel kind of problem? Like, are we still trying to solve this? In a, in a one size fits all approach? Or do you think there are ways that we might be able to work on connectivity based on how connected or not the individual is and try and get at more sort of um, distinct strategies or approaches? Yeah, I, I would say, I think a lot of it depends on kind of what the use cases are for the users, right? And so when you're looking at streaming media, or if you're just doing, you know, a video chat or, or basic, you know, text, then then there are different sort of bandwidth needs. But I would say the minimum that we're always aiming for here is is, is broadband internet speeds at 25 megabits per second. Um, and so, you know, I think that would be I think the standard and what the applications you want users to have, you know, and the type of experience they want you want. Um, I, I would say the other part of it is, um, you know, so. <laughs> This is something that we haven't really gotten, but we're starting to think about it where the type of devices that come in and, and where do they go, right? So does, you know, students for sure, they need a laptop, right? And I'm sure Bruce and Josh can agree uh, based off of their needs, but maybe someone else might just, it might be better for a mobile phone uh, or, or, a, or, or, or a tablet. So it really depends on, I think the user and we have to be cognizant. We have to quite frankly have the data um, to, to, to be able to back that up and then work backwards from there. 
I, yeah. Go ahead, Joshua. Sorry. Nope. Nope. Fine. Because I might end up going a little bit left. So you, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I don't have, uh, well, my thoughts are ubiquity is, you know, the key here. I, I don't, I don't, I think it's too, we, we, we get too much into parsing out different communities for different needs when we need like, and I mean, I think Jordan kind of hit at it with that baseline broadband, um, but where that occurs needs to be the home. It needs to be the bus. It needs to be the park. It needs to be the sidewalk because I mean, Jordan knows it better than probably any of us because of where you're located and your experience in the past, but I, also looking 10 years out and 20 years out, I mean, the digital divide is going to be maybe slightly different. Maybe access isn't as big of a key, a big of an issue in 10 years, but digital literacy skills are because we're talking about augmented reality and artificial intelligence. And, you know, when I'm 80 sitting there wondering, is this a real person? Is this a bot? Like, who am I talking to? What is my comfort level? And so for me, it's like designing I hate to use the word systems because at the same time, I'm also seeing issues with these systems, but it's designing sort of a, 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 a procedure and a process that's continuing, continuing to evolve based on where we're at technologically. And all and also reminded that it isn't about the technology, it's about the opportunity that people are trying to create in their life. I don't want a laptop just because I want a laptop. I want a laptop because I got to do my report or I got to write my resume yeah. and submit it, you know? And that's the reason that that's the driver to me. Yeah. And I, I mean, the only thing I'll add to that, <clears throat> like there's a really wise man that's trying to develop an anti-fragile ecosystem. Uh, that, that's Jordan. Um, and like, uh, that, that's something that actually resonates, uh, with, with the work that I think that all of us are, are, are seeking to do. And really when we began focusing, um, at the level of the community that we serve, one of the things that we're prioritizing is creating a, uh, legitimate like data ecosystem where we're like, look, the American community survey for most communities is what we use to define the issue. There, there are several problems with that. Um, one of the main ones is one, there's a two year lapse in the data. Uh, and then two, it's collected at the census track level. And I think that these problems don't just exist at the census track level. These problems are mm -hmm. deeply entrenched within our communities. And so the more data that we collect there, then that should be framing the, our interventions and whatever we're doing. And so one of the things that I always, uh, I, I've been bringing up a lot more recently, but you know, there's probably about three years ago when the uh, Amazon Fire Stick was just like the thing. And you went to barber shops, you went to all these places that you would swear um, oh, you know, these households don't have internet. They don't have, it's like, okay, people were, were literally saying, Hey, I'm jailbreaking a fire stick. It's like, wait, whoa, whoa, that's a really, really technical term. Like that's tech jargon that people are using and so comfortable with like, no, 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 you got to jailbreak it. And it's like, okay, there are legitimate entry points into these communities that we have sometimes historically have had a lot of uh, difficulty connecting with on this topic. And it's like, okay, at what point do we look at where we already are? And then like a ways where it's like, okay, we might we, we could end up here, but in order to get here, we're meeting people where, where, where they already are. And so like, I, I definitely agree with uh, Jordan's approach of saying like having the end user in mind and then the use is there too. But I also definitely agree with Bruce too, where it's like, okay, but at the same time, like as we're looking at building this type of approach, we're looking future focused enough to say that, hey, if this is going to be another reality that we're envisioning um, with respect to AI, AR, whatever, it's like we are uh, putting in place the ecosystem um, that then could afford those type of that, that, that type of focus to be realized. Otherwise we're just going to create digital divide 2.0 and it's like, okay, we've yeah. moved on from access. Now we're looking at who doesn't have access to this new tech thing. And so it's like, no, you just build the ecosystem, right? Have some driving principles and make sure it's adaptable to uh, the, 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 the new ever changing landscape. Great. Yeah. Um, no, I think the digital divide 2.0 or perhaps 3.0 is a, is a scary is a scary vision, especially when we think about we're trying, like, in some ways, a lot of our economy and a lot of our, um, you know, social um, and civic activities are really, a, like, forward, you know, they're, the, mo the forward momentum is to be online. And so um, imagine really creating this dual class of citizens that are connected and not, and, or, or, or really having that even more entrenched than we already have. Um, okay, last question, then I'm going to switch to Lily, who has questions in the Q&A, but, you know, Jordan, you alluded to this hopefully not being sort of the issue du jour, like, and that we keep this momentum going. What, um, 
What are some real outcomes, um, let's just to get very, very candid that we can expect to see maybe over this next year, um, year and a half? What are, what are things, what are specific things that communities should really, folks in the audience should really be striving for to make sure um, happen in their community? Um, and then there's a reference to like, uh, there was a question about what's this American community survey that you mentioned, Josh, and just for folks in the audience, it's basically the, um, the, the five-year survey, um, which goes out every year or so, um, that's put out by the census in between the, in the census years, and it'll let you know um, what the level of connectivity or not is in your community, although there's some flaws with the way in which it's, it's done, some would argue, and so it may not capture the full extent of the digital divide. But, but real outcomes, like what can we, what we should be, what should we be striving to really get done over the next year, year and a half? Josh. Okay, I, I don't know why I thought that was addressed to Jordan. Uh, I must be hearing things, I'm sorry. But like, uh, I would say that, you know, for us uh, specifically, I think we've done a good job. And I think that this webinar is doing a, a good job as well of defining the issue. And many of us in our community who are a student aware, like we've done that for so long, but now it's like, okay, legitimately bridging it and like making an actionable governance structure. And so in Detroit, um, what we're doing, we're actually unveiling this on Thursday is kind of like our, our larger community structure. I mean, we were working in a uh, collaborative, like our, our initiative is called Connect 313, 313 being the area code for Detroit. And um, you know, we were convening partners, but now it's like, okay, no, Let's actually get like board governance, like uh, legitimate committees, subcommittees, like voting power, sentiment analysis, and getting all of those things under one umbrella. And then from now until December, uh, or I should say January, um, you know, we're, we're, we're going through the motions. It's, it's a bit of preseason right now where we're saying, okay, yes, we could be responding to a crisis, which we are. We are already doing things, but we're also saying, let's take this long-term approach and say, we don't need to have to, you know, fundraise for every single crisis. What if we built the infrastructure the right way? So this entire time, that's what we're doing. However, moving into next year, that's where dollars get allocated, resources get allocated. We're being very exploratory. We're setting up things on, like we have different subcommittees, our committees, like one's devices and connectivity, one's digital literacy. It's pretty much that three-legged stool. Um, but for devices and connectivity, we're saying the standard now probably shouldn't even be broadband. If it's going to be 25.3 and three upload, well then, I mean, that's really technical, but we're just saying we are setting our own standards and so therefore, as we set our own standards with the resources that are available, i.e. funding and just personnel, well, then that's then going to shift our focus into saying what we can legitimately do, uh, you know, moving forward. And so we're really focused right now on structuring, operationalizing and exploring what resources we have. How can we enhance those and how can we justify and in investing new where we just don't have anything? Yeah. And, and going on to his point, you know, I, I think, you know, Josh, when you mentioned you know, I think all, a lot of cities are going to be facing sort of budget, uh, you know, uh, cuts or, or, or difficulties ahead, right, in terms of our, our, bill, our fiscal management. Um, and so I think prioritizing, you know, if you have a smart city plan, prioritizing your digital inclusion projects, and particularly, you know, thinking about the needs. So right now it's students, right, for sure, right, because we have school starting for us on August 12th. Um, and then the other part, so, you know, our library is doing fantastic work, partnering with the Department of Transportation, Parks and Rec to, uh, to be able to get community Wi-Fi up and going. Uh, the second part is our, you know, our library also, we have 11,000 hotspots with a telco uh, partner to be able to deliver those hotspots in the hands of uh, identified students in partnership with our counties uh, um, and, uh, and, and really be able to make sure that the students are, are, on, are connected ahead of school. Um, and the third part is, you know, not forgetting the rest of the community, you know, those who are homeless or elderly and saying, okay, what's next that we need to accomplish. But I think just this year alone, operationalizing, as Josh mentioned, that's the key thing, right? Um, and then we just have to keep hustling until we're across that finish line. I think looking a little bit further down the road is I worry, you know, with this rush, what happens next? You know, right? Who are, are people going to stay connected with these plans? You know, you get them for one year, what happens on year two? Uh, same thing with community Wi-Fi. These things are good for three to four, maybe five years, you know, out in the open. What happens next? Who's going to do operation maintenance and upgrades? Um, and so these are all considerations that we have to plan also ahead of time, just, you know, that base layer of infrastructure. Hmm. Very similar. Uh, one thing I would add is uh, taking this opportunity to 
work, especially within our city and county governments. I think we have an opportunity here in Charlotte to get both city, county government and our philanthropic community um, one step more involved, uh, you know, taking one step at a time. And so to Jordan's point about, you know, who's here at the table today and are they going to be there in a year from now? Uh, you know, one thing that we have been contemplating and we being the Charlotte Digital Inclusion Alliance is having conversations about how many people who come to the, our meetings have a responsibility that's tied to their performance and their job description or how many people are showing up in that room because they personally care and they're allowed to give that time. And there's a huge difference between those two. Both are, both are needed, both are required, both are very valued, but the difference in somebody who's a Jordan or a Joshua who works for directly for the city who has some responsibility for overseeing a plan or part of a budget or can influence those things is different than someone who who may not who may be showing up because it's related to their job but it's not expressly written and so for I think that's one of the opportunities we have because of COVID and because there's this increased attention is how do we help those organizations think through the role of their human capital involved in solution development. Great. Lily, uh, questions from the audience. Thank you all. Yeah, no, this is a great conversation. Um, so I'm going to bubble up a, a couple of um, the themes that I'm hearing from the audience. Um, and so we'll, we'll, and we'll do rapid fire um, answers so we can get through a, a handful of them. Um, so the first one um, I, I, I thought was really good context setting. Um, it was a question around this has been the digital divide has been an issue since the 90s. Um, I know like Knight Foundation funded in the 90s and and so, and I, Jordan, I see you nodding your head. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll throw it to you first. Um, uh, so can you tell us a little bit about how this issue has progressed over the past and evolved over the past 20 years? Yeah, I would say one thing is, is emphasizing, I think the, the, the literacy part and the other part is mm -hmm. also the standard, right? And I think the standard, the goalpost continuously moves, like I said, you know, as, as applications, as come online, you know, in terms of, you know, how people are engaging, let's say media right and, and sort of bandwidth needs so i would say that's the the only difference but i would say yeah i mean even smart cities have been a topic since the explosion of information communication technology back in the 80s 90s as well yeah yeah and and, and so i want to i want to build upon that point around the the digital literacy piece and the the media um in particular the media literacy um there was a question around how do people adopt technology so that they can be served properly as quote humans? Um, and and there is there is particularly a question, um, and I think they're referring to digital literacy. But then they said, you know, media literacy is really an issue, and especially around misinformation and disinformation. Um, and so um, so so uh, could could one of you speak to to that and how we should be thinking about addressing that piece? Bruce, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I'm I, uh, processing here. So kind of uh, off the top of my head, I mean, one thing that we really try to do is um, my, my digital Charlotte is housed at a university, Queens University of Charlotte, located really close to the Uptown Corridor, have some incredible faculty to help us uh, design and develop the program. So my role is mainly out in the community, collaborating with students and faculty and then, and then serving um, our broader regional community. And so um, one thing that we have is some expertise in some media literacy and health literacy and digital and health literacy. And so um, when we design our workshops, we don't design them uh, with the intent of teaching somebody a technical skill. We know that there might be technical skill development happening, but it's usually about some broader goal like staying engaged in your child's education or um, understanding and building community around your health uh, your health and and media literacy is a component that generally weaves through all of those so for us it's it's ingrained in all of the workshops we do whether you know there's some level of media literacy of understanding recognizing sources and being able to to think critically about what you're consuming and so um, again I think it's very intersectional with all of the things that we do that's the way we think about it we're not perfect at it we can do more but that's just where we're at right now got it Josh, did you want to jump in on this? I saw you nodding your head, so I didn't know. I, I, I just, when, when Bruce talks, I disagree. Um, <laughs> yeah. What, 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 the one thing that, well, the one thing that, um, you know, we're, we're doing, uh, and, and it's, there's multiple things, but um, I guess that I'll, I'll highlight here. Uh, 
I had mentioned earlier that we're focused on data services uh, as one is like a shared service to the larger community. We've created a digital equity fund, again, for the larger community. Uh, we're looking at neighborhood technology hubs for the larger community. Uh, but there's this community storytelling piece uh, that we're really focused on as well. And I think that's where we start to tie in to that media literacy thing where it's like, hey, community owned storytelling um, that actually informs and influences our advocacy on this topic. Because that's, again, the missing link oftentimes where people are doing this work. It's just the stories aren't really getting told. And so our focus is saying, well, if we shift the power, uh, ultimately that when I'm talking about governance, that's a power structure. And as we are seeking to empower other people through this shared service approach, well, then it, it's, um, it's an incentive to um, indulge or learn a little bit more on this digital inclusion journey than it is to, to Bruce's point again of identifying just a technical skill. And so for us and saying like, hey, like this is articles that are you know, written by Detroit or for Detroit bias, like that type of model, and then trying to scale it there opposed to, um, you know, doing it in a very robust, uh, I'm, I'm not saying academic, but you, you get the point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and so, and, and as you're talking about like shifting power, is that, because there were a few questions around the, like the three prongs and the fourth prong, is that, is that getting to that fourth prong piece, like the, the economic opportunity piece? I, I, I think that there are multiple stools um, in within or, like a library, in my opinion, is the perfect three legged stool on one. Um, mm -hmm. a, a branch is a three legged stool. And so there are microcosmic stools there. And I think what we're saying is like, hey, let's build like, oh, it's going to be cliche, but I don't care. Go with me. Let's just build a table <laughs> with all of these stools, um, you know, at, at the table. And so like, um, that's kind of like how we're framing it. And that power is now us saying like, hey, we have a community coalition that is at equal power to our board uh, that we're building that's going to oversee a lot of this work. And so by having that power structure broken down by saying all of our recommendations are coming from the community and before we're investing like dimes or we're literally getting this community sentiment. And so then it's kind of like, you know, giving people an opportunity to scaffold um, to understanding this in a way that maybe wasn't uh, offered to them previously. Got it. Okay, that's really helpful. Um, I'm just going to get to a couple more questions um, that, that we had in the queue. So um, one was around philanthropy. And, and so I, I think each of you um, talked about philanthropy. Josh, you, you, you um, talked about 23 million, I mean, serious dollars re recently going towards um, Digital Divide and, and Detroit. Um, Bruce, you mentioned philanthropy, and I believe Jordan, you did too. Um, we do have in our audience, we have a lot of um, local funders um, who, who attend um, these sessions. And so, so I, I, you know, my question to you would be, um, to, to, to three of you, is, is how, how do you think philanthropy can really play kind of a, a, a a catalytic role without a better word in this you know i mean uh, there, there could be a tremendous amount of dollars um that, that municipalities and the federal government can give but but what 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 is the particular role philanthropy could play well i our charlotte has neither a 21 or a 24 million dollar fund so i don't know if i should answer this question i feel on my screen you guys are like right on my, either side of me so i'm like um, you know, feeling it, but, uh, you know, two things, one for me is convening power, you mm -hmm. know, in, uh, the, the, not that we also have convening power being associated with the university, but, uh, sometimes the, uh, that, that convening power through philanthropy can bring new perspectives to the table or perhaps bring the right people to the table and the decision makers to give you the time to hear beyond the three-legged stool, right? And if you had a, a three-legged stool on your bingo card today, you win. Um, but uh, yeah. um, but that and and you know it's it's really nuanced because it is intersectional with every other issue. So if you're funding affordable housing, like we see in Charlotte, or if you're funding workforce development, are do you do you are you know are there partners like us at the table who are helping inform the way that the digital divide impacts? affordable housing or impacts workforce development in a way that the funding can be aligned or, 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 or perhaps even carved out like the, like Detroit and San Jose have done to specifically address those issues. Um, so, I, you know, those are my two, two areas where I think that they can, they can play a role. And that also requires partners like us providing that information and being there shoulder to shoulder with these philanthropic organizations. And I'd also include corporate social responsibility as well, because they play a role in this too. 
so I, I think that one, like prior to me coming to Detroit, I actually worked at the Cleveland Foundation, um, local community foundation in Cleveland, Ohio. And, you know, that allowed me, it informed me the way that philanthropy should be involved in this. And I, I, I do think at times, um, you know, cities where you have a, a really big dog, like a Cleveland Foundation, there, there are some things where I'm like, okay, that might not be applicable for everyone. But as I'm in Detroit, and I'm working from, you know, the municipal government lens, and I'm looking at my community foundations, I'm not necessarily looking for them to fund this model in, per, in uh, perpetuity. That's not how they, they, they operate. But what I do need them to do, I need them because, they, well, one, they're proximate to a lot of leadership, and they then can validate the cause beyond what I can do. So I can validate a cause, like generally speaking, because I'm doing this for the city of Detroit. But they then, within their respective areas, are allowed to push that message in a way that I can't do it. And so, like, it's not necessarily always a capital ask for digital inclusion. I think that's where we unify and we create a fundable model that is worth uh, getting national investment or that's worth getting investment from the, um, from the federal government and some of these other larger private uh, companies that then can support this. But in order to get that, we need to be aligned at that local level. And I think, uh, to Bruce's point, the role that a philanthropic organization can fulfill is definitely the role of a convener. Um, they can help us push policy as it relates to this issue. And they can, again, just be a, that neutral partner that's proximate to enough leadership that allows this cause to live on in, in rooms that, quite frankly, um, some more digital inclusion activists just aren't in. That's a, that's a that's very powerful. Thank you. Jordan, did you want to hop in? Yeah, and I, I just want to say one last thing is that I think the philanthropy piece plays a really important role, particularly for us as we think about, you know, city budget cycles and quite frankly, how often our, our hands are tied in terms mm -hmm. of our ability to execute, right? And so um, they are essentially like a rapid procurement channel almost and in, in the ability for us to immediately address the community need um, and, and, and very quickly. And so as long as we are able to, as you know, Josh and Bruce mentioned, elevate their voice to be like, here, here's your impact on the community and, and map that very clearly. And as and it aligns with our donors goals, I think that would be the key thing. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's also unfortunate that the cities, we can't move quickly enough, mm. right. To act things. Yeah. yeah. And, and the only other thing I'll just add, cause I forget, I keep forgetting this, but it's like, you know, with this as local leaders, we have a responsibility of uh, protecting philanthropic investments as well. And not making it seem as though if you're a philanthropic organization, you're investing here, that you're just doing it. And then we're not there to one validate or say, hey, let's steer you in the right direction. Hey, dollars really need to go here, given that I think we have a responsibility too to engage and be very candid and transparent and supporting our philanthropic organizations. Usually it's a one way street, but in this one, no, let's set it up two way to say, how can we support you as you are supporting the work that we're doing? Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, the two way street. Absolutely. So I'm going to last question. I think it's I think it's a good kind of broad, broad question to, to ask. So so what crossover or connections, if any, exist between the digital divide um, and geography, race and the local tax base? Yeah, uh, Josh, you know, you go ahead first. Actually, I was going to ask to repeat the question. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. So what crossover or connections, if any, exist between the digital divide and geography, race, and the local tax base? So, yeah, you can go ahead. Massive, massive, uh, massive. I mean, it, it, I, I would say one geography, the Midwest, for example. Mm -hmm. I'm from Cleveland. We're doing this work in Cleveland. I'm in Detroit now. These are Rust Belt cities that are seeking to find their footing um, in a changing landscape where historically they had a certain economic structure that doesn't really work right now. And so as we look at digital literacy, digital skills, and digital inclusion, broadly speaking, it's germane to our cities to figure this out. It is literally in our, the fabric of our renaissance and our revitalization. And so it's like one, it, that is, I mean, obviously other cities could, could kind of come up with a way, but it hits, it hits differently here in the Midwest. And uh, I'll also say on the race piece, uh, when we look at the American Community Survey, we're looking ac across the spectrum. Um, uh, people of color are, are gonna be least likely oftentimes not to have high speed internet and computers. Those are things where it's like, okay, well, well why is that? Well, that's for a variety of factors, which goes into the adoption piece. And so um, when we look at this methodology from a general sense, like, yeah, we'll all subscribe to the same one, but we know where the differences are and how we need to just kind of you know, reconfigure this in a way of saying that, hey, and a lot of these large black cities, we're seeing them have churches in a lot of these neighborhoods. 
And so my digital inclusion advocacy is going to be much more faith driven in some communities. Um, yet we're still subscribing to those same, those three legged stools. And so I would say that um, all those factors that are yeah. listed definitely inform the way that we do this work. And we on the ground have to be mindful of that. Yeah, so it's everything, essentially, <laughs> those, those factors, everything. Um, uh, so, so we can end there. Lillian, um, come on in. Uh, we, we are over time. Yeah, we are. It's a great conversation. Great set of questions, Lily. Um, thank you, Bruce, Josh, and Jordan for joining us. Um, this uh, has been a really helpful, uh, I think, starting place for, for context and the conversation, an issue that's come up a lot. Um, so, uh, so thank you, folks. And we'll be sharing this recording. Um, for others. And you can follow these gentlemen online. Um, they're all active uh, on Twitter. And so if you have more questions, feel free to check them out. Um, but Lily, um, so next week, we're going to deal with another amazing topic yeah. um, in these times of pandemic. What are yeah, we talking we're, about? We're going to talk about downtown revitalization. Um, and so night is, um, of course, downtowns have been hit hard with with COVID, yep. and um, and many cities are are dealing with the same with you know similar issues. So so we'll discuss that. Also, night is releasing a toolkit on how to you know what to measure and and what to be looking at, what what key indicators. So it should be a good conversation. Um, I right. really really enjoyed this one too. So thank um, you. Thank you for yeah. Bye everyone. Thank you everyone for staying Take on. Take yeah. care. Bye.